Good morning, everyone. We'll get going very shortly. We just have um, attendees joining. So we'll just give it another couple of seconds and we'll, we'll kick off. Um, in the meantime, I'll do some introductions. My name is Eleanor Cunningham. I'm the chairperson of the Irish ProShare Association. I'm also a partner and head of pensions and incentives at the Camp Fitzgerald. Uh, you're all very welcome to IPSA's fifth annual Employee Share Ownership Day, or ESALD as we call it, at our conference. And I'm delighted to be here with you all digitally for what promises to be a very interesting day. Um, and a big welcome also to those of you who are watching this on playback. So the Irish Pro Share Association, for those of you unfamiliar with it, uh, was established five decades ago, and it started off as a kind of group of employee share ownership enthusiasts, and we've grown since then to an internationally recognized organization and the leading voice of employee share ownership in Ireland. And our annual conference, which we're marking today virtually, uh, ESOD, was established five years ago, and the idea behind it was to explore in more detail some of the key issues facing employee share ownership economics, business, and HR. Uh, this year, due to COVID-19, we're marking the event digitally and virtually. Hopefully next year, we'll be back in person having some of these conversations face-to-face. -face. But in the meantime, we have a very interesting uh, set of speakers for you today and uh, the same high caliber discussions as you've come to expect from ESA in the past. Um, I'd like to briefly take a minute to thank our sponsor for today, Computer Share. Um, IPSA, the Irish Pro Share Association, is a not-for-profit voluntary organization that is run by volunteers such as myself and the rest of IPSA Council. Um, we're made up of people with expertise in employee share ownership and including companies who run employee share ownership plans, but also professionals from the legal tax and accounting spheres. We all have day jobs, however, so it wouldn't be possible to run events like today without the support of our sponsors. So thank you very much, Computer Share. Um, now, before we kick off into the main body of the presentation, I just wanted to touch briefly on the work of IPSA and some of the key projects that we're looking at at the moment. Um, one of IPSA's major milestones since we established the ESAD conference five years ago was successfully lobbying the government to get the key employee engagement program share scheme up and running. The idea behind that was to get um, an, a share scheme that would work for the SME and startup community to help try and uh, incentivize and retain staff in a very competitive environment. Um, that was successful and it came into being in the budget 2018, launched by Minister Pascal O'Donoghue. And the idea behind it was providing um, share options to key staff in small and um, startup companies uh, in a tax efficient way. However, unfortunately, um, it hasn't been taken up as readily as we would have liked due to some of the technicalities in the legislation and some of the limits. So IPSA continues to work with um, or organizations and the government to try and fix some of these issues. Now, um, uh, subsequent budgets had introduced more uh, measures and um, increased some of the limits, which might make it more attractive, but we're still waiting on a ministerial order to um, implement those changes. So IPSA is working on that at the moment. And I know other speakers will talk on the KEEP scheme later, so I won't say any more about that. Um, the other main focus of IPSA's lobbying events recently has been in relation to the Save As You Earn Share Option Scheme, or SAYE for short. Um, SAYE, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, is a tax efficient all employee share scheme under which a company grants options over shares to its employees. Now, the SAYE is linked to a formal savings contract between employee participants and a third party financial institution. And at the end of a savings period, which is typically three or five years, um, employees have sufficient capital to fund the exercise of their options and acquire shares. Now, it's a very popular program, and those of you who are familiar with it will know from your own organizations how popular it is. And there's some of Ireland's key organizations run an SAYE uh, program. However, there are, historically were only three financial institutions that operated these savings contracts, two of them, YBS and Barclays or UK institutions that operated in Ireland by virtue of EU passporting legislation and following Brexit, um, that, that was no longer possible. IPSA successfully lobbied the government to get a ministerial order in place to allow these organizations to run off their existing grants, but there's no new grants um, capable of being um, uh, offered. Uh, the third institution that offers SAYE was Ulster Bank, which all of you will be familiar, has announced an exit from the Irish market, which is putting the future of SAYE schemes at jeopardy. Um, so 
IPS has called on the government to um, help secure the future of these revenue-backed SAYE plans, which now are at risk due to Ulster Bank's decision to withdraw from the market. Um, we need to find another viable provider of these savings contracts in order to continue the um, plan going forward. We estimate that Ulster Bank has approximately 6,000 SAYE account holders with a value of 20 million. And we've contacted the Department of Finance in order to see what can be done to secure these accounts and also find a, a provider going forward. And we keep you posted on that. We had a meeting with the Department of Finance yesterday, so we are making progress. So back to today's event. The theme of today's conference is incentivizing the workforce of the future. Um, and over the next hour or so, together with our three speakers, we will look at how businesses of various sizes and profiles motivate, retain and incentivize their staff. Um, we have three great sessions. We're, in terms of running order, we're going to start by hearing from Claude Logue, who is head of HR for Fitbit. And after Claude, we'll hear from Martina Fitzgerald, who is CEO of Scale Ireland. And finally, Sarah Conroy from Deloitte, who's also on the IPSA Council with me, is uh, going to be delivering a presentation on the Irish share scheme landscape. Uh, Nigel Derrick from Computer Share, unfortunately unavailable today, so Sarah stepped in last minute. Thank you very much, Sarah. And we'll finish up by 11.30 at the latest. A few housekeeping points before we hand over to Cloda. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the Zoom platform that we're using today. Um, you have the opportunity to ask questions of our speakers using the Q&A function, and they'll be asked anonymously, so don't worry about that if that's something that might concern you. If you have any technical or audio issues, uh, generally we find that that's a connection issue on your end, so you might please try logging out of the session and back in. And if that persists, so please feel free to get in touch with us using the Q&A function and we'll do our best to assist. Um, finally, all the presentations are being recorded and will be available on our website after um, the session is over. Also, the slides will be there for you to look at in your own time. Okay, so to get us started, I'm very pleased to welcome Cloda. Cloda joined Fitbit in October 2015 to lead HR for Fitbit's growing international business, including EMEA HQ in Dublin, uh, where she's based, but also in their global regions across Europe and the Asia Pacific region, including China. In this role, Cloda works with HR and business leadership of the company to design and implement the necessary strategies and programs to support the company's organizational growth, structure, and development. She was responsible for the global people's operation function. She has over 20 years experience uh, and a wide spectrum of HR experiences across the technology sector, including recruitment, change management, organizational design, generalist HR and communications, working in both Ireland and international roles, including a number of years in Australia. Over the last 18 months, her remit has included her HR due diligence and the integration work related to the acquisition of Fitbit by Google, which was completed on the 1st of February this year, and many of you will have read about. Um, and she has assumed the role of HR director in the global devices and services business. So, Cloda, very welcome. Over to you, and I'll be back for Q&A at the end. Thanks, Eleanor. Thanks, indeed. Um, so... When I arrived at Fitbit five years ago, the company was in a very interesting place. Um, it had just become a publicly listed company in 2015. The IPO had, had gone very well, but we were at a crucial point in the company's, at that stage, fairly nascent history. And there were issues emerging with regards to employee sentiment, attrition, a turnover of leadership and uh, notwithstanding the fact that from the moment the company became a publicly listed company, I will say that um, share ownership was a fundamental pillar of the organization. Every single employee received shares at Fitbit when they joined and refreshes of equity every year were made available to nearly 90% of the staff. So, uh, you know, that pillar was, was absolutely set down and was very instrumental and fundamental uh, to the culture of the company. And yet, in spite of that, there was clearly a lot of work to do to create a true sense of shared ownership in the culture of the organization. Um, I, I could easily talk through eight different uh, components of our plan for 50 minutes on each slide. But actually, I'm just going to uh, walk you through at a very high level some of the components of the approach that we took. And we started at the top. Um, building a high performance leadership team um, was, you know, as, as any of you who may have followed, you know, the literature in this regard, 
um, beginning at the leadership level is fundamental if you're trying to change the culture of the organization. And so building a high performance leadership team was where we started. Um, we had a burning platform already with the level of attrition that we were facing at the time. And so with the, the benefit of some research to hand, we were, we were clear in our minds that when senior leaders started to model the behavior and cultural practices that we felt were needed, that that would help us establish the path for change that we needed to put in place. So we took um, the work um, of Patrick Lencioni's high performance, uh, or also known as five dysfunctions of a team for those who, who are familiar with the work, which focused on trust, conflict and communication. And really candidly what we did is we brought the leadership team together and we started off by helping them to get to know each other as people. It might sound really obvious and a sort of basic place to start, but it was crucial to try and build trust which enabled that team then to address matters of conflict or business challenges that they were facing from a different place. We also partnered with a company called CultureAmp to uh, establish a set of leadership 360 uh, diagnoses. And we also uh, engaged CultureAmp to establish for the first time uh, um, an employee listening process, which was the first step of building a culture of feedback within the company. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, but the 360 was something that we rolled out to each executive and we ensured that they had an individual coach working with them on that holistic feedback that they received as a result of participating in the 360. And we also went the next level down. And for all people managers, we uh, also surveyed a, what's called a 180 survey, where you're getting anonymous feedback from direct reports of managers um, as a way of enhancing their own insight into their people manager capability. Um, the next, having kind of spent some time with the leadership level, we, and I think this was probably almost the most instrumental step that we took to really drive the change agenda that we needed, was to shift an, a, 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 the scope of the relationship that we had with the board of directors of Fitbit uh, from thinking about talent as just Remco, you know, the, the exec comp focus, the, which is bread and butter, for a board of directors when it comes to the sort of the people agenda. But it became too easy as a result for the CEO and the leadership team to get mired into the crisis of the moment on product launches and roadmap features and quality. Um, but by expanding the board's attention and partnership into a broader human capital agenda, we were able to enlist and recruit the support of the board on the wider people and talent strategic priorities that we felt as an HR organization needed that sponsorship for investment and support. And, um, you know, I, I probably won't be the only time I'll mention this, but um, Fitbit was a, a loss making company and um, we were definitely in the throes of some really significant commercial challenges around this period of time, 2016, 2017. And so securing any kind of investment for you know, employee engagement, sentiment related work was something that was a significant issue. And as a result, some of what you're going to hear me describe was actually done on, you know, pretty basic resources, fairly scrappy. It was certainly not, um, you know, a, a multi-million dollar exercise spread out over numbers of years. And I think it's important to mention that because candidly, some of what we have done um, would be relevant, I think, for smaller companies with limited budget, limited investment. But what, what we had from the board and our work of the leadership team was a, 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 an intent, a, a commitment to address some of the talent and engagement issues that were threatening to undermine the performance of the company uh, in a way that, that was no longer sustainable. And so building organizational capability to try and become a higher performing organization was really where we started uh, the work down into the body of the organization. And we set out a number of key fundamental uh, projects of work to achieve a number of outcomes. We wanted to make sure that every employee knew what was expected of them and where they stood. And that required us to establish programs of performance and goal management in the organization. We felt it was important that people who are critical to our organization 
um, and were high performers knew that and that we had a framework to identify and, and manage that high performing talent um, and ensure that we were investing in critical talent in key roles. Um, we also wanted to ensure that we moved from what had been a long history of sort of very generic bonus allocation with no real performance attributes uh, associated with those outcomes, that we moved towards a pay for performance culture and ensuring that people who are really outperforming came away at the end of the year with differentiated uh, reward outcomes. Um, and associated with that, um, and I mentioned our partnership with Culture Amp previously, we started to establish a, or attempt to put in place a much more continuous feedback mechanism in the company and much more spontaneous opportunities for recognition as well. Um, Fitbit, like many organizations, would say that you know, they aspire to give every employee a great manager. We recognize that we also needed to invest in manager capability. Um, it wasn't really adequate to have you know, leaders thinking about how some of these things needed to change if we didn't have confidence and competence in our manager community to help deliver that experience to the employees uh, in their teams. Um, I haven't really yet mentioned the vision and the mission and the values of the company and how they fit into this work. And um, you know, it, it may sound lofty, but Fit, Fitbit's vision um, over this period of time and still today is to make everyone in the world healthier. And that culture is grounded very much in, you know, it's a very purpose-driven culture consequently. And even at times, candidly, when it felt that we as a company didn't have much investment to make in some of the programmatic elements that might make up, uh, that might enhance the employee experience, that mission to make everyone in the world healthier was a very adherent um, mechanism for all of us as employees of the company uh, to really feel like we were achieving something. So we took that mission and translated into a set, into a set of simple commitments to really help people think about how we work, who we are, and what we stand for. And those were, as you can see on the slide here, how we champion the customer, how we rally together to get work done, and embrace the challenges that we face. Um, doing what's right, making things we're proud of, focusing on the customer at the end of the day, um, as well as thinking about how we work together in communication, in respect for each other's contribution in pursuit of these objectives, and taking ownership with a real bias for action. So these were some of the things that we started to embed into our performance management thinking, in, how, in, in the rewards and the incentives that we gave people around their behavior, not just what they achieved. But we also needed to firm up some more quantitative uh, measures of performance in the company. And we adopted OKRs, objectives and key results for the first time in 2020. Um, this was our first year using the OKR methodology and they definitely enhanced um, our ability to deliver much more clarity around what was most important for us as a company. Um, I mean, you can see that they were spread out across four different dimensions, both kind of commercial and talent related, um, but they were also made really visible within the company. At any time, my individual OKRs as an employee were clearly connected to the OKRs of my manager above me, which in turn was related to the wider OKRs of the organization as a whole. And this helped make trade-offs in what work we should do or not do when we were facing resource constraints or there were other challenges where trade-offs might have been required. But something of the secret sauce underneath a lot of this was the degree to which we really invested in employee listening. Um, and what started off as, I would say, quite a degree of hesitancy and reluctance on behalf of the leadership team to do employee surveys. And I would say on our initial efforts, the, the outcomes of those surveys were sort of employees tended to look at the leadership team and go, what are you doing about this now? Whereas by evolving the way in which and the frequency with which we started to engage the employees and bring their voice into leadership conversations, it meant they started to expect to be asked for feedback, but also equally it gave us an opportunity to build accountability for solving the challenges that employees were identifying much more broadly in the organization. So yes, we want to hear your feedback, but 
we also want you to get involved with taking action to address these issues. Um, we went from an annual survey to quarterly pulse checks to try and increase accountability um, so that we didn't veer off track. And what you'll see here is something of a, the, the kind of the numbers story um, between 2017 and 2020, where we increased our overall employee engagement score by 21 percentage points over three years. Um, and that really was as a culmination of not just the fact that we were surveying people more often, obviously, but the other programs of work that we put in place around performance management, around differentiated rewards, around manager capability. These were all things that started to add up to an enhanced employee experience for the team. Our attrition levels started to come down or at least move in line with industry norms at the time. And of course, then, you know, the pandemic arrived um, and that really created a completely different platform for the organization. And, and what I would say is that if I, if I lean back on the vision and the purpose of the company to make everyone in the world healthier, um, you know, the company found itself with that sort of a mission and objective in the middle of a health crisis. And so, you know, over the course of 2020, when employees were scattered, everyone was working from home, you know, it's a well-worn and well-understood story at this stage. Our focus as a company and the commitments that we had set down, you know, independently of this, this crisis two years previously, really created a lot of cohesion across the organization. Um, and it, it encouraged our, the adoption of those commitments and behaviors. Um, but it also ensured, um, or rather, it also required of us to make sure that we were placing well-being, not just for our customers, but well-being for our employees at the heart of our culture. Um, I would say it was something that we had always done to a, I won't say to a unique degree, but it was certainly much more visible in our employee culture to be active during the day, to make healthier choices, you know, have a walking meeting. We had treadmill desks in the office. You know, these kind of things were the physical symbols of the fact that a company like Fitbit wanted to place employee well-being at the heart of what it was offering employees. But we certainly had to make exponential efforts in that regard. So having a, having a well-built muscle for listening to the employee sentiment that was had been established before the pandemic really kicked in uh, in March of 2020, meant that we had that channel through which we could start to respond and ask, let the external environment drive the nature of what we were asking employees to talk to us about through those surveying. Uh, and, you know, while it was, it has been a challenge for us as much as it has been for everybody else, um, I'll talk in a moment about some of the outcomes that we've seen and, and the pride actually that the company has identified and employees are saying that they feel in working for the company, particularly over the last two years. But it's also required us to think a little bit harder about uh, our inclusion and diversity practices. Um, and we spent a bit of time addressing this at the leadership level as well and helping our managers to think about how inclusive working practices needed to be much more conscious during a remote working environment, um, whether that was responding to, you know, emerging trends and, and, and issues of the racial justice movement, but also we tried to spread it right the way across the different dimensions of our organizational agenda. Certainly the culture of the company was something that we wanted to be synonymous with inclusion. And we needed to think about that from a talent pipeline perspective and how we were recruiting, uh, recruiting talent into the company but also thinking about the community around us, the community in which we as a company operated. How could we give back? How could we contribute to communities um, that mostly re that represented the, the diversity of our customer base? We were also thoughtful about the marketing partnerships that we established, as well as the degree to which we try to bring more inclusive um, uh, research into our design process in particular. Um, we established, uh, and we've always had a health business, a, a business to be a B two B enterprise business, which is about establishing um, corporate relationships for users of, of Fitbit devices and services. But actually, again, over the course of the last eighteen months, 
our opportunity to really deepen research health partnerships around the way in which some of the technologies that Fitbit have can support efforts to research COVID has also uh, you know, been, been a particularly uh, a badge of honor, I think, for many of the teams involved with it. We also looked at supplier diversity and some of the processes, programs and policies, you know, the language that we used internally and the way in which we wrote job descriptions. So very much as sort of a systemic effort over the course of the last 18 months um, has also played into enhancing the engagement that our employees feel about being part of Fitbit. So in conclusion, um, these numbers that you see on the slide are some of the high level uh, percentage point movements that we've seen on some key questions that we asked consistently over a three year period. Um, and, you know, I'm pleased to say that, you know, uh, as of 2020, the sentiment around our leadership team and the degree to which our employees view that our leaders put people at the heart of the company's success has increased by 33 points. Um, the confidence in our leadership team has also increased by a similar margin of 26 points. And the degree to which our employees were willing to advocate for the company is a great place to work has also increased by 25 points. But the result that I'm personally most proud of is the fact that 90% of our uh, employees at that time said that they felt very proud to work for Fitbit. And there were many teams where that result was at 100%. Um, so, you know, certainly not, a, you know, a journey of perfection. There was definitely still a lot of work to do. Um, nonetheless, I think we had really moved from being a sort of who are we, what do we stand for organization, other than being a successful IPO company with a great device into something that was a much more mature, considered employment environment for people to do great work. But of course, as was mentioned at the outset, um, at around November 2019, um, we entered into um, an, an MOU to be acquired by Google and the deal finally closed on the 1st of June uh, 2020. Um, so the next big question, of course, is having you know, laid down a lot of these foundations, how we will continue to build on that progress as we integrate into the much larger company of Google. Um, but uh, I, you know, that's, that's in the future. It's, it's work that we're just starting to do. But hopefully some of the story that I've just told you gives you a sense of the multi-pronged approach that uh, a company of Fitbit size and, and um, you know, history. I mean, we were an eight, nine, 10 year old company when we started this work. Um, you know, the journey that we've been on and the efforts that we've made to uh, enhance that sense of outcomes for our customers and for our employees and stakeholders. Uh, I think we'll take some questions, um, but hopefully. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Clodagh. That's fascinating. I mean, kind of a whistle stop tour there, but some of the things you've said uh, really kind of point to how much work is involved in making, in making these kind of changes. Um, just a reminder, if anyone wants to ask a question, to use the Q&A function, but um, I might kick off. Um, you mentioned there's so many things I could start with, but I, I might be seeing as we're all sort of in this hybrid working from home. Um, you know, what challenges do you see for this sort of continued engagement in a, in a hybrid working model? I, I think a lot of us are operating in the assumption that being in the office five days a week might be a thing of the past. So uh, what do you think in, as we move forward into sort of working from home and hybrid how, about the challenges for employee engagement? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. The, the move to suddenly dispersed remote workforce was a, you know, a massive shock to the system. But then, you know, like everything, we're creatures of habit. We started to establish some new norms around that and, and by, by we I mean you know the collective and um, not just Fitbit or, or Google or anybody else but I think most of us just as humans in the workplace you know we've established a new routine. The returning to offices or a hybrid version of that is another reset moment because it is going to require much more thoughtful um, infrastructure, I think, to balance that hybrid set of outcomes where you could have some people physically in the office, some not. How do you ensure the common experience is maintained for those who either choose to come into the office or need to be in the office or are required to be in the office with those who are not? 
Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how do decisions get made and how do you ensure that you, the democratization that was the move to Zoom for everybody is maintained in, in a hybrid reality. So um, I, I don't think there's a company in the world that has the answer to this yet, but I think it's definitely true that we are all working frantically to try and think about not just how that how to do that, but how to do whatever that is going to be in a way that's right for your organization. Um, because it, there's also a reality, I think, that every company is going to have to find some blended set of outcomes for the next phase of this transition and reestablish or recalibrate a new normal for people. Um, and I think there will be a readjustment um, for sure. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, we hope to be on the successful side of those outcomes at Google. Um, but we there's going to be a lot of trial and error. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think you're completely right that nobody has the answer yet. And I think part of the question that people are struggling with is how much remote working people are going to continue to want to do and all that mix. Um, but sort of staying on the engagement theme, you know, do you have any, how did you approach uh, engaging with different cohorts of employees and different generations? So we have kind of Generation X, Millennials, now Generation Z, and um, I'm, kind of, I'm in the Millennial, I'm in the middle there, but do you find that there are different motivators for those different groups and, you know, Generation Z and Millennials famously being far more, uh, you know, conscientious about social, environmental, governance issues. Yeah, absolutely. You know, well, I mean, uh, Dublin, uh, I, I think Dublin is a microcosm. Uh, you know, the, the Dublin talent market is a microcosm, I think, of, a, of wider global trends because of the fairly unique, I think, international footprint of the workforce that we have here. And there's no doubt that if you were, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a French national in your 20s, sharing an apartment with three or four other people who may or may not have been strangers to you you know two years ago um where your entire life and possibly even what you ate came to you from your workplace yeah. was taken away from you and uh, that that person's experience is extremely different to somebody who has a family at home who has some kids that they're trying to perhaps homeschool while also work and who are just glad not to have to commute you know, so there's no doubt that the needs were extremely varied um, and also where the different demographics landed in terms of management and sort of, frankly, you know, positions of power and authority in the company was also important to tune into. Um, so I think we we made, you know, significant efforts to enhance the amount of outreach that we did and creating social connection opportunities for those who wanted to participate. Of course, it could only be virtual. Um, but we also uh, offered people a lot more leave. We uh, allowed for a lot more flexibility. We gave people more paid leave options. Um, we encouraged managers to use what might have been sort of limited morale budgets, you know, for team nights out, to send meal kits home to people, to join a team meeting on a Friday, and to really up the ante in terms of just social outreach and creating just drop-in calls. Some teams I know just opened up Zooms that weren't for meetings it was just you could work with your camera on so that you could if you had that question that you'd normally ask the person who was sitting beside you could say oh maria well i see you there and just you know some of these practices stuck some of them didn't but we, we had to try and do something um and find ways to create those points of connection for people who needed it those who didn't there was no obligation to participate in some of those things mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. some interesting ideas there. The, the camera on thing never really occurred to me before, but that's actually a good idea. Um, one thing is just going back to your presentation, you mentioned about changing the kind of um, structure of reviews to 360 for leadership. How did that go down when you started it? I, I know sometimes people can be a bit reticent to that sort of change. How did how did it go down internally? Um, you know, it we we by making the 360 tool available to leaders and consequently became available to you know most senior management kind of an, in an on-demand fashion in the future um once we secured the buy-in initially at the leadership team level that this was a team that needed to be like team one they needed to start to behave as a team mm -hmm. and think as a team and get to know each other as a team in the way that frankly they were expecting their teams further down their organizations to do mm -hmm. a major part of that required um you know a willingness to be humble and vulnerable with each other 
and having that full picture of you know how others perceive you both your strengths and areas of weakness and acknowledging the blind spots that we all have uh, was a sort of a table stakes activity i mean it would have been very difficult i think for that exercise to have been complete and meaningful if we hadn't brought 360 feedback into it um and you know to be honest it, there wasn't any particular resistance to that exercise in and of itself once there was agreement to sort of go, jump into this and feel the discomfort that was inevitably going to come with it um and uh, i think everyone to a, to a person um really found the process valuable yeah um did you have any um kind of people reluctant to give the feedback up the chain um or did you find that wasn't it, it was anonymized um so and i think that's essential um and you know for all employee listening processes surveys or otherwise you could only see a result as a manager if you had more than five respondents um, some larger organizations will set that threshold even higher to further increase um, anonymity of respondents. But for 360, you can only see, you know, the feedback from a group of people called my direct reports or mm -hmm. my stakeholders or whatever. So, you know, there is that um, safety. And no, I have to admit, I don't recall encountering any resistance other than, you know, it takes a bit of time to do this in a quality way. Absolutely. Um, I've got a, a question here, which is one I know that a lot of organizations are struggling with about how uh, you've gone about recruiting and integrating people in remote working environments. So obviously the last 14, 15 months, any new hires have been yes. presumably starting mainly remotely. And I think it's a, a challenge a lot of us face, I mean, about getting culture across and, and getting the person up and running. So how have you managed it? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> it's not... Uh, we had this issue at Fitbit independently, and then we we kind of had the mega version of this by 1,700 of us being acquired into a company mm -hmm. where we're all now working for a new organization of people we've never met. And so, you know, it has been a, a very illustrative um, experience, you know, illuminating experience for all of us to go through it. But one advantage we did ha have a, as Fitbit when this became a reality for everybody is that we are a, a highly distributed team. We had a team of 70 co-located in the office in Dublin and we had a couple of hires that we were joining the Dublin office that you know we hadn't met and but we've always had a distributed workforce right the way across Europe. Many of in fact none of whom have offices to go to have always worked from home. So we had a long history of recruiting people and onboarding them remotely in another country to work from home. So that definitely helped um, it, it, it needed some customization to a reality where everybody was being hired and onboarded virtually. Um, and we needed to particularly support managers who were hiring those individuals into their team to be thoughtful about how they helped that person get to know their team. Now, the challenge, I think that depending on the level of hires that you're making in your organization, certainly if you've big, you know, interns or apprenticeships, I think that is a, a unique set of, as a unique cohort that Fitbit doesn't have. So we didn't have to think about that particular group. But yeah. it's one thing to think about onboarding people just into a team and getting them to know their team. But, you know, over time, if you're thinking about building your career and you want to know, you know, who are the movers and shakers? You know, how do I meet that senior person and that senior person? So that certainly wasn't easy either. Um, and uh, at Google, I will say that, you know, they've, um, they've had the scale and the resources more than we would have had just at Fitbit alone to um, really put a very comprehensive suite of resources in place to address the reality of virtual onboarding and uh, creating network opportunities that would have been physical in the past. So I think that the short answer is, you know, yes, you need some time and resources to do it, but I think you can do it on very little other than being very deliberate about acknowledging the need to do it differently, to put some time and effort and resources and management, you know, need management time into being much more deliberate about the fact that you're just not going to see people in the way that you used to. So how are you going to create those touch point moments?
Yeah, I think that was the key word, deliberate. I think a lot of us are finding in remote working, you have to be far more deliberate with engagement yeah. generally. You can't rely yeah. on bumping into someone in the in tea room, for exactly. instance. Exactly. Um, speaking of doing things on a, on a limited budget, you, you mentioned that when you were kind of ramping up employee engagement, you, you were sort of doing it in uh, an environment where the, 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 it wasn't maybe as commercially uh, profitable as it, as it is late now. Um, so how would you advise companies in similar situations, sort of smaller companies on the practical day-to-day -day engagement when they don't have a huge budget? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the, the truth is you can, you can, for me, if I had, you know, could only have done one thing of all the things that we did, if I could only have done one thing, um, I would have, um, and I'm assuming a bit of leadership support for this effort, but I think the employee engagement survey, and you can do it at fairly low cost now. There's so many more companies out there that offer kind of web-based solutions um, and tools to help you with this effort. But what, what, what asking employees for their feedback and sentiment gives you is data. It, mm. it moves from being, I think, I feel people are, why are people leaving? I don't, you actually get some data that leaders and managers can respond to and think about um, and put some action around. And then you get the opportunity to see if you're making progress in addressing those issues. Um, and I think it, it puts the whole idea of employee engagement into a much more quantifiable, actionable sphere um, which is often where I think managers and, you know, CEOs and execs struggle. It, it mm -hmm. feels very nebulous and, you know, can we not just pay them and, you know, hopefully they'll do a good job kind of thing. I think there really has to be some data around the employee sentiment that gives you a platform for action. Um, and even if you don't have a lot of money to spend on what those actions might be, you can, you can engage your employees then in a dialogue. We've asked you. This is what you've told us. Here's what we can do. Here's what we can't do yet. And here's why it is incumbent on people who ask for feedback to respond. Let people know what you're going to do about it, up to and including the things that the company is not going to do anything about. Um, and I think that's where sometimes these efforts can go awry. Um, because, you know, I, you asked me for my feedback. I gave you my feedback and then I never heard another thing. Yeah, um, you know, those interactions don't cost a lot of money. But again, they do require a bit of thoughtful uh, consideration. Yeah, but that's very interesting. Thank you. So time for just one more question. Um, so I, I know at the end you sort of said that you're starting the journey about how to integrate Fitbit into Google. And obviously you've put a huge amount of effort into employee engagement in your own culture. So, you know, have you any initial thoughts on how that's going to go now that over the next kind of period of Fitbit's life? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the... You know, one of the most exciting reasons um, behind Google's decision to acquire Fitbit is what Fitbit represents in terms of Google's wider strategic agenda um, in you know, becoming a more helpful Google. And for us, um, you know, our mission to make the world healthier and Google's ambition um, and frankly scale and resources to fuel that vision um, is, is extremely coherent. And it feels very coherent within Google now that we're here. Um, there's no doubt that, you know, over time, you know, just being a 1700 person company versus 130,000 person company, you know, the law of large numbers will dictate that our culture will start to be diluted over time. However, I think there's a huge amount of respect for how the way, how Fitbit has gone about what it has achieved um, that Google holds, you know, for us, and then they want to preserve that. This is not about assimilation. This is about adding what Fitbit has done successfully into a domain that Google needed our expertise to be successful in. And so um, I think there is a lot in common in terms of that mission, um, which I think will probably lay the foundations for the Fitbit business unit within Google to still have that sense of being a highly purpose-led organization within a much larger equally purpose-led organization yeah that's fascinating thank you very much i mean but i've sat there all day asking you questions but we'll we we'll let you go so like thank you very much Clodagh, for that cool. it's really interesting so um for our next session we are going to hear from martina fitzgerald who is ceo of scale ireland 
uh, Scale Ireland is an independent, not-for-profit organisation that supports and advocates on behalf of the Irish startup, um, tech startup and scale-up companies. Uh, Martina has over two decades of senior communications experience working as a national journalist, including her time as political correspondent with RTE. She's a best-selling author and a visiting fellow at Columbia University in New York last year. Uh, she's also a board member of DOFUS and the National Screening Advisory Council. Uh, Martina was appointed CEO of Scale Ireland in November 2020, and she's going to talk about the challenges facing the Irish startup sector, the importance of employee share schemes as a tool to attract and retain talent, um, the issues in structuring those awards and the, in the current legislative environment, and what support startups need from the government and what lessons we can learn from abroad. So I promise to be a very interesting session. I'll hand you over uh, to Martina. No. Uh, Eleanor? Hi, Martina. Hi, I don't think I can be seen on screen, but... Um, I, I can see you. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, Eleanor, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And also, I'm delighted to be taking part here in the Irish Pro Share Associations event this morning, because this is a critical issue. Share options is just so critical to the sector that I now represent. And this morning, I'm going to outline uh, the reasons why this is the case and the work that Scale Ireland is doing uh, to look for policy changes in this key area. Now, firstly, uh, many of you will know me, and if we could move on, uh, as Eleanor mentioned, for my previous career, I was a senior journalist with RTE for almost 20 years, including political correspondent for five years up to December 2018. And I took a professional a sabbatical in 2019, and I'm delighted that I did, given the impact of COVID-19, because that involved a lot of travel, lecturing women and public life in China, Brussels, Washington, and also teaching communications to young women in Laos and undertaking a visiting fellowship in Columbia University in New York. And that is where I saw the great work that was being done in relation to journalism and technology, and also the huge potential in relation to startups. And last November, I was appointed, if we move on, the, as Chief Executive of Scale Ireland, which was set up in 2019 by Liz McCarthy, who's a tour de force, Brian Caulfield, who spent almost 30 years mentoring, funding, founding startups, and Patrick Walsh of Dogpatch Labs. And they set up a Scale Ireland to represent, to support and to advocate on behalf of Irish tech startup and scale up companies. And at the time, the feeling was that the sector wasn't being well represented in, in the sense it didn't have one voice that it could go to in, to stakeholders. So Scale Ireland was born. And if we move on to the next slide, you'll see in terms of the sector we represent, uh, there are currently more than 2000 startups right around the country. and they employ 47,000 people. And coupled to this, for every one job created by a startup, uh, which are also referred to as innovation-driven enterprises, five more jobs are created in the wider community. So there's lots of potential in terms of employment. And those jobs, by the way, if we move on to the next graph, are located across the country. There are 190 firms based alone in Cork, 150 in Galway, 90 in Limerick, and there are also smaller groups in Clare, Kerry, Kildare, Louth, and Waterford. So this uh, sector is an important source of regional employment. And as we all know, in the program for government, this is what the government wants to promote employment in people's communities. Now, if we move on, uh, if when we talk about startups and scale ups, um, we're talking about such a wide uh, range of companies operating in a very wide range of sectors uh, from fintech, from agri tech to enterprise solutions, clean tech, uh, security, med tech, e commerce, and it goes on and on. And these companies, though, have one thing in common. The vast majority, the overwhelming majority of these companies are focused on exports from day one. And this is very important because the OEC, the OECD has recently expressed concerns about Ireland, Ireland's SME sector and also its export potential because only 6.3% of Irish SME employer firms are engaged in exporting activity. And that compares to 10% in France, 17% in, U in the UK, and also to 27% in Denmark. And only this week, we've also seen the huge potential of this sector yet again. 
There are now four Irish tech startup companies that are valued at more than $1 billion. And they are, they are known as unicorns. And they are, as you can see there, uh, Intercom, WorkHuman and Finergo. And as of this week, Let's Get Checked has joined that uh, illustrious list. So it's important to realize the potential of tech startups and scale up companies in terms of innovation, export and regional enterprise and employment. However, since I have joined a Scale Ireland and was appointed last November, one issue has consistently come up, whether you're talking in private to founders or at public events. And that is the key challenge for the sector. And that's the retention and recruitment of highly trained staff. And Indigenous startup and scale up companies, they're under pressure to recruit and retain a talented and highly skilled staff in order to scale their innovative solutions and services and ultimately to grow their operations. Firstly, Irish startups simply cannot uh, compete. They're not in a position to compete with the larger companies with greater resources to pay bigger salaries. And multinationals often offer compensation packages in the form of salaries, bonuses and pensions that sometimes we are hearing are often two to three times higher than what a scale ups and startups can offer or afford. Startups also have to compete with firms that are based in other countries with more favorable share option schemes. And that's another difficulty. And it's also worth noting, I think, at this point, that there are very specific dynamics uh, in relation to the startup uh, sector. From the very outset, uh, startup companies have cash flow issues, and that's because they're investing so heavily in innovation in technology and also in the right employees with very specific technical and management experience in order to grow but their recruitment budgets are very limited now recruiting highly skilled staff is critical as i've stated to the success and growth of startup companies but it's also critical to their ability to raise capital because venture capital companies make investment decisions based on the experience and commitment of the founders, obviously, but also their teams. Uh, so understandably, you can, you can you know, gather that many Irish founders have been very, very vocal about the challenges they are now facing in retaining or recruiting the necessary staff for their operations to grow. And at our recent webinar and if we see this in our in the next slide with the Thornish Minister for Enterprise, it's actually the one before it, Leo Varadkar, uh, we heard from two uh, really great founders, Bobby Healy, the founder of Mana Aero, which is a drone delivery service business, who has very ambitious international plans in terms of online food and pharmacy delivery. And the company was just recently awarded a, a new drone operator certificate by the Irish Aviation Authority, which really opens up huge EU opportunities. And of course, Bobby has spoken about his plans in relation to the American market as well. And he previously founded and sold Car Trawler, the world's largest mobility marketplace for airlines. So what he has to say is important. And at that event, at our event, he stated very honestly and told the Thornishta, the most difficult pressing challenge at the moment for companies in this sector is getting and keeping people full stop. And even when he was heading up Car Trawler, this was an issue. He was constantly losing staff to bigger companies with deeper pockets. And he views salary as a very blunt instrument in terms of the retention of staff. For him, stock options would be a better tool. And really, it is giving employees a stake in the company. Claire McHugh also spoke at our event, and she's the founder of Axonista. And she spoke uh, really eloquently and very directly about the issues also in relation to share options. And by the way, just in case you're not familiar with uh, her company, it's an interactive video technology company which enables video commerce for media companies. And again, their company, their customers include QVC, the Home Shopping Network and Virgin Media Ireland. So you can see the wide range of customers they have, national and international. And Claire spoke very frankly about the difficulties about the Keep Share Options scheme. And she said that you have to spend so much time trying to understand and navigate it. And that time could be spent concentrating on building your company, that it is very difficult to navigate that scheme. So Irish entrepreneurs at that level, and even in private, uh, are constantly raising this issue and the challenge of the retention and recruitment of staff, which is critical to to their growth. So Scale Ireland believes that we need a targeted government support to help 
these companies to expand their operations and in a recognition of their economic and export potential, this could be achieved through specific changes to Ireland's treatment of share option schemes for startup and scale up companies, because we believe share option schemes are a more viable mechanism and solution to retain staff than increasing salaries. So this brings us on to the KEEP scheme. And the focus of Scale Ireland's attention uh, really is the KEEP scheme. And as Eleanor mentioned earlier at the beginning of this event today, that the key employee engagement programme is a share option scheme, which was introduced to the 2017 Finance Act, specifically for employees and directors of certain qualifying SME companies. And share options under the scheme are not subject to income tax, to USC, to PRSI at the date of exercising the option to acquire the shares. And generally, a key employee must hold the option for 12 months prior to exercise or may exercise at any time up to 10 years after the date of grant. Now, the aim of the KEEP scheme is, quote, to help SMEs attract and retain talent in a highly competitive labour market. So that's the official aim of the scheme. And it is also designed to help early stage Irish companies successfully compete with multinationals to attract and retain, yes, key employees. However, as we all know, and as I've mentioned, Startups are cash constrained and their ability to offer share options and ownership is a critical way then of attracting talent. However, so far, uh, there has been a very, very low take up, as Eleanor pointed out, of the KEEP uh, share option scheme. And the latest figures from the revenue commissioners that were given in a parliamentary question in October 2019 show that a companies granted qualifying share options to 87 key employees under the KEEP scheme during 2018, which was the first year of the scheme. Now, 2019 is the earliest year in which individuals may exercise their options to acquire shares in the qualifying companies. And we are still awaiting the latest figures. But across our sector, I think it is fair to say, very fair to say that the expectation is, and the widely held expectation, is that the take up levels are going to be low. So here is what, I'm, on the screen you see the three key areas that we believe need to be addressed. First of all, we need to remove the link to salary and raise the cap on share options under the KEEP scheme. At the moment, equity ownership under the KEEP scheme is linked to salaries. However, as we've discussed, cash constrained startups may pay below market salaries. So we feel it's important to remove that link under the scheme. Now we recognize also, to be frank, that KEEP uh, option share uh, keep option uh, share option scheme will result in reduced taxation for employees so an unlimited amount of remuneration in the form of keep compensation would not be appropriate and we recognize that so therefore we believe consideration should be given to introducing a higher cap ultimately limiting share options to a percentage of the total equity of a company that could be granted on the date of granting to an individual and the scheme should also, we believe, be widened to include non-executive directors and key advisors. And here's why. Startups really need uh, access to their advice. They play a pivotal role in providing startups with expertise at a critical stage of their development. Uh, and many directors and key advisors, uh, they simply don't have access to them. Uh, so that would be a critical change as well. But overall, we believe these changes would allow Irish startups to compete for technical and management talent at home and abroad. Now, the second uh, proposal that we are seeking is greater certainty, certainty if a company grows, which is, insert, which is essential for all businesses. They require certainty. And the current rules limit the value of the KEEP share option awards. So the total market value of the issued but unexercised qualifying share options do not exceed three million per company. However, we believe that this may punish company growth, which is entirely counter to the government's goal of supporting the growth and development of strong domestic startup ecosystem. So we believe, again, consideration should be given to increasing uh, the limit of share awards available to a qualifying company to a percentage of the total equity of the company. And this would give certainty around the scheme as a company grows and make larger Irish companies eligible under the scheme and therefore more attractive to employees, which is the bottom line. And finally, the simplification of the process is, is needed. 
early stage startups simply do not have the appropriate staff or the resources or the appropriately uh, sized legal teams and accounting teams or budgets to set up and implement a complex scheme like KEEP. Uh, for example, determining the market value of the shares is critical to the implementation of KEEP, but there's no a clear or safe harbor guidance about how uh, startups can determine the value. But, for instance, allowing for standard industry practices, such as relying on the valuation of the most recent round of financing, would give founders the simplicity, the clarity, the certainty they need to implement KEEP. And alternatively, I'm going to go back to this, the valuation requirement could also be replaced uh, with a limit on a percentage of the equity of the company that could be granted on the date of granting to an individual, as I've spoken about before. But overall, we believe that replacing the current valuation method under, under the KEEP scheme at the moment will provide greater clarity to founders and make the scheme more accessible to target businesses. And this is a theme for many schemes outside of share options that they're just simply very difficult and cumbersome to navigate. So ahead of the budget, Scale Ireland is still developing and consulting on our policy platform in this area with our partners in the Alliance for an Innovation Driven Recovery. And that comprises of the Irish Venture Capital Association, HBAN, which is Ireland's largest network of angel investors and syndicates, also Euronext and Tech Ireland. And we've all come together and identified these critical areas in terms of the share option scheme and we've commissioned research in the area. And our proposals also come at a very interesting time when there is momentum at EU level to address this issue. We're involved in various e European initiatives involving 27 EU national representative organizations for startups, and they've identified the need to introduce attractive share option schemes as being critical to ensuring the growth of the European tech startup and scale up sector. And by the way, all of these initiatives also have identified the potential of this sector in terms of growth, exports, uh, employment all across Europe. So we have an opportunity, Scale Ireland believes now, to act and to reap the benefits here of Indigenous high uh, innovation driven enterprises and their potential and to unlock that and we, we really can't let this opportunity pass. So we're really appealing uh, to government uh, to start this conversation in earnest now and to address the key issues under the KEEP scheme. Eleanor. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that was fascinating. And in relation to KEEP, you know, you've, you're singing out the same hymn sheet as myself and the rest of the council. Um, and I think a lot of the points you've made are exactly the points that we would raise particularly in that this was meant to be a simple scheme that people didn't need to hire a big law firm or accountancy firm to, to implement. So that's certainly an issue. And IPSA will continue to work with Scale Ireland in relation to doing what we can to make it more fit for purpose. Um, you know, it, it, you mentioned the statistics there about how low the take-up is. And um, we're aware just from IPSA and our organization that it is indeed still that low. Um, do you have any thoughts about why the government has been so slow about implementing change in this area? Um, is it to do with the concern about sort of these high net worth startups taking advantage of it? Or, or why do you think the, the progress has been so slow? I think, to be fair, it hasn't been very high up the agenda at the moment. I think that's a fair comment. Uh, but I think it will get a different kind of hearing at the moment. And simply because of the changing landscape international, we saw the G7 uh, meeting and the outcome of that. And also, I think uh, throughout the pandemic, we've also seen uh, the opportunities and the potential of these companies. Um, and also, if you look in Ireland, we now have four unicorns. And I think the government is very open to to really tapping the potential of indigenous tech startup and scale ups. But that conversation, conversation, I think, is going to begin in earnest now. Uh, I know that the government and we all know that the government has been under pressure dealing with the pandemic. But I do think there is there is a different setting now to that conversation. I think that would be the belief of many in the sector, uh, given what's happened to the international landscape changing and also you know, we've seen on, on our doorstep uh, what's happening in terms of these companies here and across Europe. And there is momentum across Europe in relation uh, to this sector. So I do think they will. I think it could be a year or two years. A uh, change politically always is incremental. Mm -hmm. but I do think we'll get a better hearing. And I think the conversation will start really in earnest now in relation to this. So would you say you're confident of change in, in this area? I think I think I would be confident in change over the next one to two years. I think I would because I think they realise they have to address it, and I think they they want to keep, uh, you know, that potential, 
um, the potential of these startups and they also don't want them leaving or losing that staff. Uh, and I think a very good argument has been made about in terms of exports, in terms of regional development, in terms of employment. Um, so I think, and at EU level, uh, at the moment, we're involved in two different initiatives. One is with Gabrielle, the Commissioner Gabrielle, who's in charge of research, innovation um, and education. And uh, we've, as part of a group of 27 national uh, startup representative organizations, we've presented her with an action plan and share options is included in that. And it's in always included in all these various initiatives. And she's taking that serious. It's not under her remit, but in another initiative by the French presidency, for instance, uh, the Scale Up Europe, which is coming from President Macron, share options are again, one of, of the key addressing and aligning best practice across Europe is one of the key initiatives. And I want to say that because that does have an influence here. And obviously, national governments will be influenced by what's happening in, at European level. But also, to be quite honest, Eleanor, it makes sense. This is a growing sector where people are recruiting at the moment, where many sectors have been losing jobs. And these are high quality jobs around the country. It makes sense um, to help the sector and to help those companies grow and reach their full potential. Absolutely. And a, a question here that's sort of related to that is um, what other changes would Scale Ireland be looking for in terms of the tax regime generally or like not necessarily just for share schemes, but maybe for share schemes? Um, what other changes would you see would be useful to support uh, the growth of the startup industry in Ireland? Well, I think everybody is going to be very familiar with <laughs> our policy agenda and obviously reform of the Employment Investment Incentive Scheme is a key policy change. It has to, to, to change because uh, early stage startups are struggling over the last four years in particular, the number of deals are down, although the overall level of investment is very high and we always see those headline figures, but they've been struggling to raise uh, capital. And one of the key schemes is the Employment Investment Incentive Scheme. And we have made a very lengthy submission with our partners in the Alliance on how to tackle reform of that key issue and to incentivize uh, private investors to, let's be honest, invest in more riskier, but greater potential uh, enterprises. And at the moment under the investment, under this particular scheme, 70% um, of the companies that are being invested in are asset backed companies. Only 30% are for those higher risk startups. So that balance needs to change and we also need to create a culture of investment here in Ireland. Yeah, that's very interesting. And obviously you've got a great perspective on what other EU jurisdictions are doing given your work in Europe. Um, what jurisdiction do you think has the most supportive sort of environment for startups in terms of business, tax, legal? That's a very dangerous <laughs> question. But in our, I suppose, one, one of our neighbours, obviously the UK, in terms of, and I'm not just talking about your options, I'm talking about across, uh, across the board, the UK has a very attractive uh, tax a system in relation to encouraging startups and scale ups. Uh, so much so that when, when I'm on calls with EU uh, representative bodies, it could be the Czech representative body, everybody is citing the UK as best example and best practice. And we've included that in our very submissions and with the Department of Finance and the two day public consultation and pretty much everyone on those calls cited the UK as best practice in relation to a tax regime uh, for startups. Uh, and, and very encouraging. Uh, so we've even included some of the ways they could change and emulate what the UK has done in our own in our own submissions. But definitely we don't have to look very far. Um, but it is interesting. I do think there is there will be movement, some movement in relation uh, to EWS reform, I think, in the budget and hopefully in relation to broadening out the kind of investment vehicles we're also seeking. And I think everyone on the call will be very interested any scheme that there's a greater simplification of the scheme would be really important. And I think startups simply can't grapple with the amount of, of paperwork and it, that is required. And if you look back under EWS, uh, many years ago, uh, a founder called Column Line uh, qualified for the BEST scheme, which was the precursor to EWS. And he did it on a one pager himself. I can tell you there is no founder that would be able to do that. And during the public consultation on EWIS, um, one partner of, a, of one of the big four accounting firms uh, pointed out that people, startups come to him for a second legal opinion and they shouldn't have to. 
to navigate mm. that system. And I think it's like share options. You have, I know that there are regulations and anti-avoidant measures on EWIS that you have to, to ensure that are complied with, but you also have to be able that, pe that people can afford and understand how to navigate it uh, because he would not be able to do what he did all those years ago. And we all know what a huge success fire is today, which is such a for unfortunate position that some founders, like one female founder I was speaking to said, she doesn't want, she didn't call it, she didn't uh, bring forward her application because she thought it would be punitive if she did. And, uh, you know, that there is a clawback if you don't get it right, to put it simply. We're also looking for loss relief uh, to be introduced as part of that scheme. And we have some uh, other uh, policy agendas in relation to some changes to the R&D tax credit um, system that weren't enacted. And finally, on sustainability, helping and educating startups to become more aware of their sustainability KPIs. Uh, so we have a very busy agenda. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like there's a lot that can be done. I mean, is there any kind of quick wins that the government could could assist? Like if you were saying that they're very easy things we can do, some of the other projects might take a little longer, but what would you say are the kind of the, the top key, key things that would really assist in the area and have the biggest impact the quickest? Well, I think we've had the Indicon report, which outlined key issues for EIS, and mm -hmm. we've had a public consultation in February, a very, an excellent public consultation uh, process with all the key stakeholders. And I do think uh, given the amount of time and effort and feedback they have from the sector, I would be surprised if there isn't some significant and substantive movement on that. And I do think uh, there was a willingness to come back so quickly to look at it. Um, and we'd have to take even the fact that there is a consultation at the moment, feeding into the budget process as goodwill. Uh, mm -hmm. And certainly that consultation was very positive. And also I am going to say share options is never an easy win or identified one. And sometimes when I'm at European meetings, everyone always goes to the easy wins. And actually at this point, I actually made at the last meeting of one of the, the EU initiatives that that will always ensure that share options drops off the agenda. So I'm actually going to turn that around. If you were to, to have a group of founders in the room, any room at any time, they're also always going to say share options in their top three. But perhaps some of, and you mentioned it in your uh, address at the beginning, some of the um, ministerial orders could be enacted yeah. And that relates to share options. That also relates to some of the R and D tax uh, changes, tax credit changes that could be enacted. There is a ministerial order. They haven't been enacted. And maybe if there was a greater impetus in those areas. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah, and uh, um, as I mentioned, the ministerial order it is something that we raised on our call with the department yesterday. So if so, we'll continue to follow up on that. And as soon as we have any information, we'll, we'll let everybody know. Um, I'm conscious of time, so just time for maybe one or two other questions. Um, kind of changing slight tack, obviously, given your uh, literary history with Madam Politician, you have an interest in, in sort of the, the female voice, and i um, be interested to see what your take on the female startup landscape is. Is it as male dominated as we are led to believe, or how, how, how have you found it? Well, first of all, I want to congratulate you, you for a very positive gender panel this morning. Yes, <laughs> I think we could be any more gender friendly. <laughs> yeah. And actually, in many of the EU uh, initiatives to, to the Commission, we have put that on the agenda that there has to be equality in panels mm -hmm. and they have to be made official. Um, there has been some good news in relation to female founders this year, terrific news that they have raised last year 105 million. So they broke the 100 million uh, band for the first time in terms of Irish companies owned by a female founder or mm -hmm. However, uh, it's under 20% of the total number of founders in this sector are female. So, mm -hmm. and those figures have come courtesy of Tech Ireland who do a terrific report every year in line with International Women's Day. So there is a lot of work to be done to address that and to encourage more women. That's also featured very heavily. And I made a presentation to the commissioner on the, um, on the talent element in relation to our proposals for the action plan to make Europe a powerhouse uh, for startups. And one of the key issues was addressing that gap in terms of female founders. Um, but we, are in our, in our, our own organization held an International Women's Day this year. I was uh, not in the door very quickly, but I was determined to, and we held it with ORDI Hub in Kerry and also the Awaken Hub up in Derry and All Island Affair uh, and supported by Intertrade Ireland. And we had a hundred female founders on that call. And in the breakout rooms, they spoke very frankly, which they might not speak about at an official conference like this, but they spoke 
very frankly about the challenges they face and they feel they have to meet a higher standard. So there is a body of work to do and we certainly are doing everything we can in terms of our panels and how we operate and the supports that we give to female founders formally and informally uh, to help them in, in their course and to, to, to really, you know, increase the numbers. Yeah, that's that's and I know generally diversity is very important to Scale Ireland and, and something that you're working on with your with your uh, charges. Well, um, thanks very much, Martina. That's fascinating. I, I think it's a, a very interesting organization and the work that you're doing is very important. And if so, we'll continue to work with Scale Ireland and doing what we can to sort of remedy the share option side of things anyway. Uh, so thank you very much, Martina. Um, finally, for today, I'd like to welcome Sarah Conroy from Deloitte. Uh, Sarah Conroy is a director within the Global Employer Services Group of Deloitte and she also sits on IPSA Council. Um, as mentioned at the start, Sarah is stepping in for Nigel uh, Derrick, who has unfortunately had to step off. So thank you, Sarah, for coming in to the last minute. Um, Sarah advises on a wide range of multinationals in relation to their global mobility functions and compensation strategies. And she's extensive experience in the design and implementation of appropriate policies which support an organization's overall corporate strategy, compensation structuring, and the design and implementation of tax effective reward strategies. Um, she's a chartered tax advisor and a chartered accountant, and she's going to discuss the employee share landscape in Ireland. So thank you very much, Sarah, and over to you. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, delighted to be here, everyone. I think Nigel would have brought the gender balance, but uh, with him dropping off, you're stuck with all the ladies today. So just if we move on to my first slide there, I suppose really what I'm talking about today is, well, why would you use share options or share remuneration and, and what is the motivation for doing that? So if we just move on, um, I think as, as a number of speakers have talked, but particularly Martina, you know, the talent is, is difficult to, first of all, uh, hire and secondly, to retain. So a lot of the reasoning behind using share remuneration is in the whole idea of attracting talent, retaining that talent, motivating employees, um, increasing employee engagement, um, getting those employees to have some skin in the game, as we say, so that they will drive performance. So if they can feel more connected to the employer through share ownership, it drives their motivation in the workplace. Typically, you know, there's a lot of studies showing this, particularly for, you know, in the SME space, private companies, trying to retain key individuals is really important and it's very difficult for them. But again, even in larger companies, to be competitive in the market to attract employees, uh, they need to have share remuneration as part of their overall reward strategy. So if we flick on, I'm just going to talk a little bit about, uh, sorry, there should be a slide before that. Yeah, in the listed companies space, what are the common plans that we are seeing in practice? So in a lot of companies, we do see a lot of restricted stock units, particularly in the US multinationals. If they're UK companies headquartered, we may see restricted stock units or they may call them performance shares, which are typically similar to restricted stock units. A promise is something you get it after a period of time if you stay with the company. We also see share options being used, the common Typical share option, not approved, you know, not tax effective, but it is very useful to, to retain employees. A lot of US companies will also have employee share purchase plans, the ESPP, which is really a, a savings plan in that the employee will uh, put money aside each month from their paycheck, net of their tax. Uh, and they will save that up over a set period after which they can buy shares at a discount. So they're quite common in some of the larger companies. In the context of approved plans, uh, some companies will often do that and they may look at, you know, what suits in different markets. So in an Irish context, they have looked at approved profit share schemes. Um, so they're still quite successful. Um, they're very useful in the context of you can use the bonus scheme as the employer contribution. So they can be cost neutral for an employer, which is very important in the current climate. Um, 
And also SAYE schemes. But as Eleanor mentioned at the start, the challenge with SAYE schemes is that since Brexit, really you're relying on Ulster Bank as the uh, savings provider in an Irish context. And with their announcement of departure, it's not clear yet whether anybody else will come in as they move out over time. So there's real question mark over the viability of SEYE schemes unless a new savings provider comes on stream. And I think that's something that we have through IPSA been pushing with the government in terms of, you know, is there any alternatives here? Can some savings providers be brought in to, to, to keep SEYE alive? Because it is a very useful tool um, for listed companies to use. If we just move on, like I was just going to briefly, I suppose, explain at a very high level the tax treatment of the restricted stock units versus share options. So with stock units, it's really a promise today of something in the future. And they may vest after a year, they may vest, vest after three years. Each plan will have its own rules. You don't have any tax to pay until you get the shares. So the employee will receive the shares on vesting. They will pay income tax, USC and employee PRSI at that point, and that will all be required to go through payroll. So it's fairly seamless for the employee in that they see or they get communication showing the number of RSUs and shares that they receive, um, the number that have been withheld for taxes, and then they'll have the balance remaining, which are their shares to do with what they, what they wish. In the context of restricted stock units, the only reporting to date has been through payroll. But with the there's a new reporting obligation which has been introduced. So the Finance Act 2020 introduced this, but it is applying it with effect from 1 January 21. And Revenue's view is saying that applies for 2020 vestings. So the deadline for completing that form is the 31st of August. The form is not yet available, but is due to be issued on the 21st of June from revenue. We have done, a lot, IPSA have done a lot of lobbying about this with um, you know, revenue and pushed back significantly. So our current understanding is that the grant of RSUs will not be reportable, or if it is, it will be an optional section to complete. So that will hopefully remove some of the uh, administrative burden that's coming with that reporting. Share options are also taxable at the point you get the shares. So they're generally taxable on exercise. The tax on market value at that time, less any, anything you pay for the shares. And that income tax is payable by the individual. So there's no payroll withholding on share options it's payable by the individual within 30 days. In the context of share options, it's just important to make sure that if they have a life of more than seven years, that they're granted at market value. Otherwise, there can be tax charges at, at grant. Uh, there is reporting for share options, and that's been there for a number of years, but that was quite acceptable from the perspective that the employer did not have any withholding so they're completing this form and it's their only reporting. So that form RSS1 has been here for a number of years and is due to be filed each year by the 31st of March. If we move on then, I was just gonna talk briefly about um, share remuneration in private companies. And I think this fit, fits neatly in with, you know, a lot of what Martina was talking about in, in that private companies, you know, are under pressure from a cash perspective as, as she's, she's fo largely focused on scale ups, but generally in the private company space, you know, remuneration may not be as high as it is in larger organizations. So they will often want to use share remuneration as part of their reward strategy in order to attract or retain talent. The plans that we are seeing in private companies is your typical share option plan. So it's not approved. So it has income tax at the point of exercise, but they are easily understood. They're relatively easy to implement. So some companies like them in the context of, you know, something that can roll out to all employees and that's easily implemented and administered. We also see a lot of restricted shares where there's a restriction placed on the shares for a number of years. So this is provided for in the legislation. So 
the value of the shares can be reduced in line with the restricted period. So we do see that used quite a bit by private companies, particularly where they're giving to a small number of employees. There's a number of conditions to be satisfied, but they are all very easily managed and it just needs to be set up correctly. Most plans in a private company will have some forfeiture provisions because from, from the existing shareholders perspective, if somebody is to leave, they will want those shares back because there isn't a market necessarily for these shares. So they will want some control. So there will be lever provisions that you may have to forfeit what you were given if you've already acquired the shares or that your options, et cetera, would lapse if you've left within a set period of time. We also see some companies using what we call growth shares, which is really where you participate in future value in the company. So the existing shareholders may not want to share the value they've already built up. They may be bringing in somebody new to the business where they're willing to share future growth. So they'll give them a class of shares which can only participate in value above a certain level. So that can really work in certain circumstances, particularly if there's value in a business. I think we won't labor the point on keep, but I mean, as you can see, I've noted there, there's very limited uptake on keep. Um, and that is due to the complexity of it, the challenges, the salary you know, restriction, because in a lot of private companies where the income is lower, you know, that that cap that you can't exceed that annual remuneration means it's just not something that's going to work for the business. I think if the ministerial order is signed, it will solve some of the issues, but it won't change the salary levels and some of the points that Martina raised, which are really key, I think, to making that viable for companies. Um, so that's really just a quick kind of run through of what we're seeing in practice. And it fits in with, I think, what all the speakers have talked about, that share remuneration is definitely um, topical. We're seeing significant growth in that area, like a lot of, in a, particularly, you know, in a lot of companies being sold and acquired, there's new plans being implemented. And I think with the talent uh, risk constraints we're currently seeing across a number of sectors, it will continue to be a key component for employers as part of their overall reward strategy. I'll hand you back to Eleanor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. And um, that brings us to the end of ESOD for this year. So I just a few thank yous and tidy ups from me. Just a reminder that the slides and all of the recording material will be available on our website. And um, if you aren't already subscribed to our newsletter, please do sign up because that's where we will be giving you updates about our efforts with KEEP and SAYE and reporting requirements and everything else that we're working on at IPSA. Um, if you're not a member of IPSA and you're interested in joining, please in, uh, email info at ipsa.ie and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And to finish up, just some thank yous. Uh, thank you again to ComputerShare for sponsoring today. Thank you for our, to our speakers for their time and their expertise to Coda, Martina and Sarah. It's very much appreciated and very interesting sessions. And I'm sure you'll all agree, uh, lots of food for thought there. Um, thank you to all our members for their support, uh, which enables us to gain the attention of government departments and policy members and lobby for change. Without our members, we don't have a mandate, so we really do appreciate your, your support. And finally, thank you to all of you today for joining us. So um, hopefully see you at another IPSA event soon. Have a good day.